2 Samuel chapter 23, starting in verse 1. It says, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the ta uh, who David had, the Tachamanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino, the Esnite, he lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. Verse 10. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave, cave of Adullam. This is the same three that it just spoke of, three of David's mighty men. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in a hold. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And so I just wanted to read that first set of passages of Scripture as we started off in the beginning of chapter 23. If you want to go back to verse 1, I don't know that we'll go to all of the verses again. But, you know, for the first at least uh, five um, or six verses, or really, I'm sorry, at least up to verse 7, the context of the passage of Scripture is focused on David as the king. And the Scripture says that these were the last words of David. And then it describes him as the son of Jesse, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And David begins to speak about the fact that God filled his mouth with his word. Amen. And that the word that came forth out of David's mouth was similar to the way that the sun is in the morning after the rain has, has been upon the earth. And the result of it that takes place upon young grass. And essentially what happens whenever you apply the sun and rain to young grass. It causes growth. It nurtures it. It causes growth. And in a similar fashion, that's exactly what the Word of God does to the people of God. Amen. And God filled the sweet psalmist's mouth with His Word. And He used King David as a mouthpiece to, to speak forth the Word of the living God. And when it, but, but then from there, the, the passage goes into men or people that David speaks of and calls them Belial. 
Now, the word Belial is used in the Old Testament on multiple occasions. One place it talks about Hophni and Phinehas as being the sons of Belial. If you knew anything about them, they were Eli's boys and they were wicked. But in the New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, it specifically uses the word Belial to describe the demonic. And, with, and so what we see here is first we see David being utilized by God as a mouthpiece, speaking forth the word of God, causing growth for the people of God, amen, and the things of God. And then it's contrasted to those that are evil, those that are wicked, the enemy of God, if you will. And he says that they're like thorns. Whenever you begin to try to, you can't handle it barehanded. Right. Whenever you try to grab a hold of thorns, the truth of the matter is, is that it's very painful. It said instead, what you got to do is you got to use tools of iron or you got to use a staff of a spear. What that's descriptive of is descriptive of weaponry. Right. Once again, we see within the passages of scripture, the time again, the age old tale of, of the cosmic war, if you will, where God is real. God has a plan and he allows his people to engage a battle that takes place in the spiritual realm. Amen. And that's that's the truth of what we're going to deal with each and every day as the true children of God. And we're going to see that within this story, the same exact thing holds true that we see the gospel played out on the pages of scripture. And then from there where we see David used as a mouthpiece of God contrasted to those that are evil and against God, we see all of a sudden out of nowhere, David's mighty men. It's almost like it was reminiscent to me as I kept going back to the passage and, and seeing the reviewing the passage again and again. It reminded me of the book of Acts. Because we know that King David is a type of Christ. There's no other person in the annals of Scripture that really describes a type of Christ better than what King David does. Amen. It was promised that the Messiah would come through his seed. Praise God. And so we see time and again that he is utilized as a type of Christ. And in the book of Acts, I'm, I'm not, you know, I want to be careful when I say this, but once again, we're speaking of types, which means a foreshadowing, an Old Testament type, which was fulfilled in Jesus. And we see it says, these are the last words of David. And whenever his words are ended, now we go into the mighty men. In the book of Acts, the scripture says that Jesus ascended unto the Father. And then from the rest of there, moving forward, we see the church age. During the, during the time frame of Jesus' life, he spoke forth the words of the kingdom. He pronounced the kingdom message. And then whenever, after he died on the cross and he resurrected, defeating death, hell, and the grave, he ascended unto the Father. Amen. And from there, we see the book of Acts moving forward. And we see the exploits and the building of the church of God and the service that God's people have had done for God during that time frame. And this is what we see with these Three men, and I just focused on the three. We did, I didn't want to get into all the rest of them, but I wanted to focus a little bit on these three. Now, one of the things that I noticed about these three men in these three instances was that in each circumstance, they faced insurmountable odds. Right. When you look back at the first one, what was his name? Uh, I, 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 I tried to write them all down, but it, to Adino. Now, I mean, the scripture calls him other things in the book of Chronicles. But Adino the Esnite, the Bible says that he lifted up his spear and he killed 800 men. Now, now some people question, now how in the world did he do that? Did he kill them one by one? Did he stab them? One, uh, I, we don't really know. But we've seen time and again where whenever God intervenes in the midst of a battle, all kinds of things happen. Right. Truth be told that whenever God shows up by the power of his Holy Spirit in the midst of a battle, sometimes the enemy starts turning their own weapons on their own self. Amen. Yeah. And so we don't know exactly how it went down that we're to believe that he stabbed each one of those 800 with his spear or whether or not he stood his ground and the people of God rushed in and, and helped him or whether God just showed up and caused the confusion to take place in the camp. We don't know the exact circumstances, whether God paralyzed them all and he indeed did kill each one of them with a spear. That's neither here nor there. The scripture says that God won a great victory through this man on that day yeah, as he withstood right. insurmountable odds. Amen. I got to tell you that whenever you're walking your Christian journey, you're also going to face many times insurmountable odds. And as a matter of fact, it happened in the other two circumstances. When it came to Eleazar, the Bible says that there was a great fight that day. As a matter of fact, he was alone. Because the scripture says that the people of God came back only to gain of the spoil. 
What does that mean? That, that, that was the treasure. That was the food, the horses, the, the weaponry that was left over after Eleazar won the victory against these Philistines. The army of God came back afterwards and partook of the spoil. But it was Eleazar that stood there and fought against the enemy on that day. The Bible says that the Lord wrought a great victory on that day. The Bible says that, that the fight was so intense and it obviously lasted so long that his hand clave to his sword. Now what that means in medicine is that he, he underwent something called a, a tetanic spasm. It was tetany. See, whenever you are fatigued in your body for long enough, your muscles work, I don't mean to get too technical, but your muscles work on the exchange of ions, calcium and sodium, negative and positive ions that allow your, your muscles to clench, to flex, to extend. And whenever you lose enough electrolytes in your body, sometimes your body will go into a spasm. Yeah. You, ever yeah. been, you ever been in that situation yeah. before? Yeah. You ever been all working so hard in the sun that you start getting cramps in your legs? This man fought for so long and lost so much fluid and so much electrolytes in his body that his hand claved to his sword. I'm telling you, whenever the fight was over with, he couldn't even, because you see the muscles contracted to the point where it pulled his, his fingers. It was as though his hand was welded to the sword. Somebody probably had to pry his fingers off of that sword whenever it was finally tied. He couldn't even let it go. They're all what God could do with men of God, women of God that would cleave unto their sword. Amen? The Word of God says that the Bible is the sword of the living God. It's the sword of the Spirit. We want the Spirit of God moving and operating in our lives but the Spirit of God moves and operates through the truth that is written on the pages of Scripture. And if you and I have not placed that on the inside of our hearts and on the inside of our minds, we do not know how to allow God to work in the midst of our lives. But God brought a great victory on that day, hallelujah, through this man who withstood the enemy. One of the main ones that I really wanted to think about, and we'll come back to him in a second, is this man, Shama. Yeah. Uh, he sat there, and, and, and what we see here, too, with all of this is we see a type of Christ. We see the story of him, and then it's followed by the story of those that served him. We see those that served him facing insurmountable odds and engaging in battles that they couldn't win by themselves. But at least in two of them, the word of God says that the Lord wrought a great victory on that day. God wants to bring the victory. Amen. Amen. But not only that, in this story of Shammah, we see a pea patch. Yes. A, a bunch of lentils. What, it's, a, it's a type of bean. Right. And, and this man stands there and he defends this pea patch. And once again, we see an enemy trying to steal from God's people the right. things that belong to God and that God has allowed his people, amen, to have a hold of. And he's asked them to protect it in the name of Jesus. And so we see, once again, in this story, this type of thing taking place. And he stands and the Bible says that well, as he stood, the people fled. He stood there on his own. And he fought, and God fought through him and wrought a great victory on that day. Then we see where all three of them, the Bible says that David was thirsty one day. He was on the run. He was in the cave of Adelaide. Saul, a type of the flesh, was not wanting David, a type of the spirit, to rule upon the throne. Amen. Just as the enemy of your soul doesn't want the, to allow King Jesus to rule upon the throne of your heart. He wants Amen. the flesh to, to win Amen. In, in, in the struggle. And he wants you to give in to the flesh. He wants you to allow Saul to remain king. But nevertheless, David's on the run. He's in the cave of Adam. He's hiding from the enemy of his soul. And at the same time, he gets thirsty. The scripture says as he gets thirsty that he says all that I could drink from the well that's at the gate of Bethlehem. He remembers the, the town that he was from. It was about 12 miles away and these three mighty men take it upon themselves to serve their king and to break through the garrison or the troops of the Philistines and they break through and they bring enough of a drink of water all the way back to their king. It says that the Philistines were lined up in the valley of Rephaim. 
That's another name for the valley of the giants. Right. It's just another stroke of the pen of God to remind us in his word that we're in a battle. I'm not going all the way back to Genesis 6, but if you'll remember where the giants came from, it should be a reminder to you that once again, we are in the midst of a spiritual war that's being played out in physical circumstances upon this earth, yes. and that God is asking us to believe in something that we cannot see, yes. and he's asking us to engage in a battle, believing, amen, that he is going to bring the victory, Amen. hallelujah, Amen. and that one day there's going to be an eternity to gain. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But whenever that water came to David, what he chose to do was, instead of drinking it, he poured it out. Yes. He poured it out as though it was a drink offering unto the Lord. There's two passages of scripture, I looked it up this morning, that have the word offered in them. Both times, it's only used twice. Both times it's used by the Apostle Paul. The first time in Philippians 2, verse 17. Sandy, could you put that up on the board for us? Philippians 2, verse 17. And in that scripture, what the Apostle Paul says is this. <laughs> he says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Amen. The word offered there, he's talking about it, the drink offering. That's the word there in the New Testament that describes what David did when he took that cup and poured it out. It goes back to the book of Leviticus. It goes back to the book of Exodus. Whenever a burnt offering was offered on the, on the altar of sacrifice, the priest would also take a hen of wine, which was a, dependent upon what type of sacrifice, whether it was a sheep, whether it was a bullock, or whatever the case. Sometimes it was a quart of wine. Sometimes it was a little bit more, and they would pour it on top of the sacrifice. It was, it was another form of worship towards God. What Paul is equating the pouring out of this drink offering regarding his own life is he's connecting it back to service for the Lord. He tells the, in the church of Philippi, if I be offered up as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. In other words, he's saying, hey, Philippian church, we have, God has moved in you, God has revealed his truth to you, and you have moved forward with the gospel, and you have begun to work to doing the things of God, and your faith is now being seen as a sacrifice, and what God has allowed me to be is like a drink offering that's poured upon the service that I have provided for the Lord, Paul's saying, is being offered up like a drink offering upon the sacrifice of your faith that has gone forward for the the kingdom of God. There's another spot in 2 Timothy where, where the Apostle Paul uses the same word again, and he uses it once again in the similar type of concept. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered. Yes. I am now ready to be poured out. Now, if you know anything about 2 Timothy, it was the last letter that Paul wrote, and he was in a prison known as the Mamertine prison in Rome. It was a big pit that was dug in the bottom uh, of, of this, uh, you know, this cell. And he was awaiting uh, the fact that he was going to be executed by the Emperor Nero. And it was the end of his life and he realized that he had uh, fought the good fight. And that the end of his days was over. And when he wrote to Timothy and asked him to bring some various articles to him while he was there. And, uh, but it says here he's being ready to be poured out. His service to God has been a lifelong drink offering, and now it's coming to the end, amen, and he's about to be poured out as a sacrifice because he understands that his departure is imminent and he's about to go with the Lord. Going back, I just took that little detour because I wanted to show you that when David poured out that water as a drink offering, what we're seeing here is that these men served their king Amen. And fought the fight, engaged the battle, brought that victory back because he had given them the victory, brought that victory back to their king. And it was offered up as a drink offering before the Lord. I got to tell you that we're seeing a picture once again here of the king of kings 
his people that have come behind him. The fact that he has equipped them to do the work of the ministry and to serve him. And that your life as you serve God is offered up to God as a drink offering. Amen. And poured out your service towards God. I got to encourage you this morning and tell you that it's not for nothing. Amen. But that instead God sees the struggle. God sees what you go through. He sees how you desire to stand strong. Sometimes the battle is weary. Sometimes you find yourself in the midst of the battle and in both of these circumstances, all of these circumstances, these men didn't quit. I know one thing for sure, that that battle that, 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 that Eleazar was engaged in had to take a long time. As he sat there on the battlefield with his hand clenched to the, shore, to the sword and his body released itself of fluids and electrolytes and his, his hand clenched to the sword, I can tell you that he was there for a long time. The battle ensued, the battle continued, and I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes you're going to find yourself in seasons in your life that you feel like, when will it ever end? When will the battle ever end? But I got good news and I got bad news. Jesus came to give you victory, but as soon as you find victory in one area of your life, hold on, brothers and sisters, because there's going to be another trial up ahead because the enemy of your soul is relentless and he will not quit. I'm here to tell you, he won't quit. Amen. And, you know, as I was thinking about this, about, you know, I actually titled my message this morning. I don't know if it goes that well with my, with my message, but the title was is that he wants to eat your lunch. The enemy wants to eat your lunch. He wanted that pea patch. Right, right. The enemy wanted that pea patch. He wanted those lentils that was in there. I can remember one time, my dad growing up, I, I, you know, everybody really loves, usually loves their dad, or at least looks up to their dad. And some dads, I don't know, my dad came across as a real tough guy. You know, I, I heard he was tough. I think he was the kind of person that maybe could back up what he said. But I kind of grew up listening to him talk real tough. He always had these little one-liners. I can remember one time... When you grow up around that, I guess after a while you kind of pick that up, you know. And I remember one time he was giving me a hard time. He used to make fun of me because, like, girls would call the house. And he'd call me names. I'm not going to get into that kid and repeat to you what he called me. But nevertheless, and I can remember one time he was making fun of me and I told him something. I'm going to say it on the camera. But I'm not going to say what I told him. But I said, I'm going to bust your butt. That's what's about to happen. I told him that. I stood up to my dad. I'm he, he laughed. He thought that was the funniest thing. He was been almost like he was waiting all of his life for me to stand up and to say that. And when I said it, he said, just bring your lunch, son. Oh. And I didn't really know what that meant. You know, I'm like, well, what, what does lunch have to do with anything, dad? He said, we're going to be there a while. We're going to be there a while. Because, see, I ain't got no quit in me. And I'm telling you right now, after a while, you're going to get hungry. And, you know, those words stuck with me. And as I was seeing the situation that these men right here, they didn't have any quit in them. No matter what they were facing, no matter what they were going through, they didn't have quit in them. And God used them to bring victory for the kingdom. Amen. And I got to tell you right now that you're going to find that sometimes you're up against a very formidable foe. The enemy of your soul, he does have power. And, and listen to me, back in the day, whenever I first got saved, uh, one of the preachers that I used to listen to a lot would say that the, that the enemy didn't have any teeth. Yeah. Yeah. He was all roar and no bite. And I can tell you something, in Christ, when you're operating in the power and the victory of what he has brought, Jesus done made him a snaggletooth lion. But in the meantime, I can tell you that he does still have teeth. Yes. And he's still roaming and roaring upon this earth, looking for whom he may devour. And he is devouring people, and he is bringing destruction. And sometimes you're going to sure feel like you felt the bite of the lion. Amen? Amen. But nevertheless, you've got to remember that in the midst of this, even though, even though the, you, will, you will find yourself in the midst of the struggle, even though you will find yourself in the midst of the trial and the tribulation, amen, even though sometimes it lasts longer than you would prefer for it to, God has brought the victory. Amen. And so when we see all of these things, I want to go back and I want to focus a little bit <clears throat> on Shama. This might be the shortest message I ever preached. <laughs> the first thing that I wanted to talk to, well, one of the other things before we move on is, is this, is that in, in all of these circumstances, it almost seems like they were by themselves. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. uh, Adino, he killed these 800 men with his sword, with his spear. It doesn't say anything about the army of Israel helping him. 
Eleazar, it says that the army didn't show up until it was time to grab the goods. Right. Amen. And with Shama, it says that the people actually turned and ran. And in each of those circumstances, it almost appears that they were by themselves. But one little hidden gem <coughs> in the midst of it all, in verse 9, it says, after him was Eleazar. I want to tell you that the name Eleazar literally means God has helped. Yeah. None of these men were alone. And whenever you find yourself in the midst of the battlefield and you sometimes feel like you're alone, I can tell you that you're not alone. That if you're in Christ, if your faith is in him and what he did for you at the cross, that now you have been reconciled into the presence of God and the presence of God is with you in the midst of the battle. Sometimes you might not be able to feel it as much as other times, but I'm here to tell you, you're not in the battle alone. Amen? Amen. All right. I want you to look with me. At uh, once again at verse 11, and it says, After him <clears throat> was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. The first point that I wanted to make about this was in the verse of verse 1, where it says the Philistines were gathered together into a troop and the people fled from the Philistines. That's my first point. The Philistines were gathered into a troop and the people fled from the Philistines. Well, what kind of point are you trying to make out of there? It was a powerful enemy. The word troop literally means a multitude. Whenever the people of God saw the multitude of the Philistines, fear struck their heart. They turned around and they ran the other way. You know, as I was thinking about this, I was considering the fact that we are in the last days. I know that I've been preaching that ever since I started preaching, but each and every day that goes by, I can see just by what's going on around me or what it appears to me to be is that I'm getting closer and closer yeah. to the end. Yeah. Now, I got to tell you that the world is feeling it. You understand what I'm trying to say? The world is filled. There's coming a day when the book of Revelation talks about the fact that the enemy of our soul, the accuser of the brethren, is going to make his last stand. He's going to try to exalt, bring himself into the presence of God. Him and his angels are going to be at war with Michael and his angels. And the scripture said he's going to be cast down to the earth. The Bible says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for he will be full of vengeance and, and fury because he knows that his time is short. I don't believe that day's happened yet, but I'm telling you, it's getting close. And he already sees the, the signs of the times. He knows, the enemy of our soul knows that he, his time is short and that the end is near. What I'm here to tell you is, is that the stuff that's been happening in the news, I don't even know if you watch the news. I quit watching the news for a while, and now I'm watching it again. And to some extent, I'm kind of glad I am. Sometimes I watch it too much, but I can tell you this whole thing that happened here this last couple of days where Britain exited the European Union. I'm telling you right now, this is this is the manifestation of the human race feeling what, I, what I've been trying to talk to y'all about, or at least those that have been here for a while, feeling the, the movement of what they're calling the elite and, and an attempt by the elite to globalize the world. Yeah. This is this is the physical manifestation through politics. The, the people that are on the news don't know how to explain really what's happening, but people all over the world are becoming more and more aware of the tactics that are taking place. And even though they don't understand the spiritual implications always behind it, if you engage people in conversation about the concepts of the Illuminati, the New World Order, and you connect it back to Jesus, I'm I'm telling you, half the time, they're already on the same page with you. They just don't really understand all the things there are to understand about Jesus. But what I'm here to tell you is this, is that the people are feeling the fact that the world leaders are trying to suppress them and move them into a certain direction. And part of the majority, a bunch of the world is saying, okay, that's fine. You're going to make us safe. See, that was the whole thing with the whole European Union. In numbers, we're going to be safe. 
You're going to make us safe if we stick together. But the, but the other people are saying, no, we want our own borders. We want our own sovereignty. We don't want to be pushed together as one globalized people. See, that's all part of the work of the spirit of Antichrist trying to move humanity into a global system, a one world order, and the people, and there's something in people that's wanting to fight back from it, but there's another portion that's on this globe that don't have a clue and don't understand, Amen. and what I'm here to tell you is, Amen. is that that's just a big old play on the global stage that reveals to us that the spirit of Antichrist is trying to move the world in a certain direction, and that people, because God has placed something on the inside of them, are beginning to fight back, even though they don't even understand completely what they're fighting for. They're wanting to fight for freedom. They're wanting to fight for their own freedom, but they don't realize that true freedom comes only through Jesus Christ and what he did for them when he died for their sin yeah. at the cross. Amen. But what we're seeing is, is a powerful enemy that's moving forward with his own plan for humanity, and I'm here to tell you that as time moves forward, it's not going to get any better. We just saw this terror act that hit in Orlando on our soil the other day. Back when we were preaching on the book of Revelation, I was saying back then that we've seen a few instances, but this is only the beginning. Yes. It's only the beginning. Yeah. And what we're, what we're seeing is that it's going to do is, is that it strikes fear in the hearts of the people. And if you watch what takes place afterwards, you see what the agenda is. Yep. Immediately on the floor of the house, did you know that the Democrats are over there sitting down inside the Capitol because they're demanding a vote on gun control? Yep. And the Republicans are shooting it down. And they're not voting on it. But as soon as something like this happens, instead of blaming it for what it really is, because listen to me, Islamic terrorism is a real threat. But hold yes. on a second. It's, it's worse than that. Yes. It's a real threat, but the reality of it is, is this, instead of them wanting to address that issue, they want instead to take the guns out of the hands of the people. I'm here to tell you that, that we're moving towards the end. Yes. And as we do, the enemy of our soul is going to have more and more tactics that's going to strike more and more fear in the hearts of the people. Yes. And while Islam and Islamic terrorists is a real threat, I'm here to tell you that there's a force that's much bigger behind that. Yes. you got to be able to see, I believe, with spiritual eyes. Now, I could be wrong on this because there's no way to prove it. But whenever we study the book of Revelation, I, I feel like for quite some time the Lord has been revealing to me. We're talking about a big enemy. The Philistines were in a troop right. and the people were running. Right. You understand what I'm trying to say? And, and whenever we taught the book of Revelation, the Lord began to show me the colors of those horses. And I talked about this the other day. The color of those horses, it's red, it's, it's black, it's, it's, green, uh, it's green because pale is, is chloros, and it's white. And those are the flags of Islam. The colors of the flags of Islam of all these Muslim nations. Now, I don't have time to break it down for you, you know, in all intricate detail because it would take too long of a time to, to bring down the history of how the Islamic State or religion came, really came about and all of those other things. But it was much later than, than Ishmael. It took place in 600 A.D., long after the Apostle Paul wrote the New Testament and warned people that even if an angel come preaching another gospel, that he should be accursed. But yet, at the same time, the prophet Muhammad heard a lying angel call him himself, Gabriel, and told him the things that he told him. And all of a sudden, this Islamic religion was birthed. I'm not going to get into alternate stories of how it was birthed, but what I want you to know is this, is that if it's true what I believe upon this earth, there are people more powerful than the nation of Islam. There are people, elite groups, powerful men uh, that hold the, the, the money, more money than Saudi Arabia has, and that they actually influence, and that, that Islam is nothing more than a sword in the hand of the people that want to rule this world and bring it in under subjection and under submission to the plan of the enemy, and they're using the Islamic flag and the colors of, of, of that nation and the tactics of that nation in order to strike fear in the hearts 
of the people to move the people towards a new world order where they will receive and submit themselves to the leadership of the world and bow their knee and say, help us, save us. And yet at the same time, some people are saying, no, we're going to fight against it. I'm just here to tell you that what, the, what the, the people of Israel saw on that day was a multitude. It was a powerful enemy. And as we near the end, we're going to see more and more of this type of stuff taking place. And it's going to begin to strike fear in the hearts of many, many believers. And many, because many leaders don't even have a clue. They're out there. I don't even know what people are teaching nowadays in the modern church. They're certainly not going to talk to you about anything like this. And definitely not on a Sunday morning. But I'm here to tell you to prepare your heart. Yes. I'm here to tell you to prepare your heart because the people fled, but he stood. Right. The Bible says that Shama stood in the midst of that pea patch. The Bible says that he stood to fight for those lentils that were right there. Now, there's no doubt in my heart that what we're seeing here is Shama having an attitude of no compromise. In the midst, as we near the end, we're going to see more and more of the church having more compromise in it, but not only that, in individual lives. Right. Shama is saying, no, there's not going to be any compromise right here. I'm going to stand for God, and I'm going to stand for the things of God, and I'm going to trust God. I can see those, those uh, Israelite army people running the other way and, and run, looking back and saying, what are you doing, man? It's a pea patch. It's not worth staying and fighting. You need to choose your battles. But what he is, Shama is doing is he's preaching a message to us this morning. Right. And what he's preaching, he's preaching right out of the book of Ephesians. And he's saying out of Ephesians 4, 27, don't give place to the devil. Amen. If you compromise the pea patch, you're going to open up the door and the enemy is going to come in and he's going to get a foothold. That's what it said. The word place means topos. It talks about a foothold. And the idea is that you're renting him a room. You invited him in. Whenever you opened up the door, you allowed the enemy to come in in the midst of that circumstance. And if you think he's stopping at the pea patch, you're all wrong. He's not going to stop till he gets everything that he wants. And in the, in the wake of it, he leaves you destroyed, broken, and all bound up. And I'm here to tell you, Shama's preaching, don't give place to the devil. I'm going to stand here. I'm not going to compromise. And I'm going to trust God in the midst of this battle. And I'm going to believe him for a victory in this area. God's looking for some people to stand. Amen. Amen. God's looking for some people to stand. Not only that, but he's also preaching out of Ephesians chapter 6. Because while the people ran, he stood. It says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, he's wily. He's a whole lot more wily than wily coyote. He's a whole lot sharper and more deceitful than what we oftentimes give him credit for. Right. Put on the whole armor of God that you may able to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. The, the truth of the gospel, amen, girts the loins. It's like a girdle that, that prepares you for travel. It was, a, it was a belt that they wore and that they would, I've talked to you all about it before, they would wear those robes and they'd pull the back of it through the front. They'd pull it up through the belt and it prepared them for travel. It prepared them for battle to prevent all that long flowing stuff to get in the way and to trip them up. The truth of the gospel, amen, is going to be a compass that's going to help you to navigate this journey journey called Christianity, but if you aren't putting it in, listen to me, even if you know the truth, there's a, there's a chance that you could veer off and be deceived by the enemy, and much more so for those that don't know the truth of the gospel. Amen. He says, take unto you, stand therefore with your loins, gird about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, he is your righteousness. Right. You know, he is the truth. Right. Amen? All of these all of these pieces of this equipment are representative of Jesus. It says, your feet shod with the preparation 
of the gospel of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Right. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you were able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I just wanted you to see, I don't want to, I'm not here to preach a message on the armor of God this morning as much as I want you to see, though, that each one of those elements represent Jesus Himself. And that when you, it's not about you getting, you know, there used to be, I, I don't mean to, to make, I'm not trying to make fun, because if you've done this, you're not the only one. But it used to be in the morning, you'd wake up, you know, and uh, you'd sit there and you'd be like, okay, this is a new morning and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put on the helmet of salvation. And, you know, you go through this prayer process where you're putting on all this equipment. We'll put it on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to gird my loins with truth. I'm going to put, shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I'm going to take the sword of the spirit. I'm ready to go take on the enemy today. And went through this ritualistic movement of going through and clothing myself with all of these articles as though that was, was, was going to prepare me to engage the battle on that day. And the reality of it is, is that if you're putting your faith in you waking up and putting on all of these articles, you're putting your faith in the flesh. Amen. Because the fact of the matter is, is that one morning it's going to be rough and you're going to hit snooze too many times and you're not going to have time to put on your armor Amen. and Lord help you when you get out there because the enemy is still on the prowl Amen. and he's looking to destroy. But the reality of it is, is that on the day, you might not have known this, but on the day that you put faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, a miracle happened. Yeah. Hallelujah. A translation took place where the old man born of Adam bound in sin was baptized or placed into Christ where you were buried with him when where you resurrected with him and now you've been clothed with him Galatians 3 27 yeah. those of you that have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put him on you have clothed yourself with Christ you have clothed yourself with his righteousness and now hallelujah you're clothed in him and he is the helmet of your salvation. Amen. He's your breastplate yeah. of righteousness. Yeah. He's the truth that girds your loin. He's the gospel of peace that shod your feet. He's the sword of the spirit. Revelation 19, 13. He was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. He said, hallelujah. He's the word of God. Amen. A sword comes out of his mouth. The power's in his mouth. The power's in his word. The power, hallelujah, for Shama is that he withstood. And God, through him, wrought a great victory. Amen. Amen. That's point number three. Amen. Point number one, the enemy was powerful and the people fled. I'm telling you, as we get near the end, you're going to see it. People are not going to know that persecution is going to get so harsh. I believe it. I don't want it to happen that way. I'd rather the American dream. <laughs> I'd rather the American dream of what the church thinks is going to happen, to be honest with you. I'd prefer to take that way. That we just sit here and live in, in our American comfort until the Lord comes back and we go to see him in the air. Amen? Amen. I hope I'm wrong on that one. I don't feel like I am, but I hope I am. But as we near the end and it gets worse, <coughs> I can assure you that the majority of the church is not prepared Amen. for what lies ahead. No. And the enemy is powerful and people yes. flee in fear. Yes. Because they don't know a real Jesus to hold on to. They don't know or understand what faith in his sacrifice really means. And they will flee. But the, but the good news is this. Is that God knows how to hold on to those that are his. Amen. Amen. He's looking for some people to stand. So point number one, the enemy is powerful. The people flee. But God's looking for some people to stand. Amen. Amen. Yeah. To stand in, on him. To stand on his word. To trust in him. Amen. And when you do that. He's going to produce a victory. Hallelujah. That was the last thing that I wanted to point out to you. In, in verse uh, 12, it says, But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And point number three, the Lord wrought a great Amen. victory. Amen. You know, I texted somebody last night and I said, Hey, man, I just want you to know I'm still praying for you. And he said, Man, I'm trying. I'm trying to, to, to throw away my trash and, 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 you know, to do the right thing. You can keep trying all you want to. You, in and of your own strength, are never going to get the job accomplished. You need to stand on God and on His Word, amen, and trust that He will wrought the victory 
through you. He will. He's already accomplished it. Amen. Amen. Jesus has already won it. Now it's about us trusting in what Christ has done to see the manifestation of it in our own lives. Amen. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, that's what we're closing with. Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. Let's start up in verse 13. It says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Well, I mean, that, that's just some beautiful stuff right there, you know, and you can't, you, you can't just read something if you don't understand it and keep on moving. You really got to stop and you got to ponder, right? Mm -hmm. hey, you were dead in your sins. When you were born of Adam, before you were born again, you were born into sin and you were dead to the things of God. The uncircumcision of your flesh. The Old Testament concept of circumcision versus uncircumcision had to do with the covenant, right? Cutting away of flesh, filthy flesh, through the shedding of blood. In the New Testament, there's a circumcision of the heart. Right. Through faith in Christ and what he did, a circumcision, a surgery takes place on the heart. The cutting away of flesh through the shedding of the blood of Jesus. He has quickened you. He brought you to life together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. In other words, all your sins are forgiven. The old man who was dead in sin died in Christ and a new man has been made alive together with him in his resurrection. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What does that mean? That the handwriting of ordinances of the law. The law called you guilty in your first birth of Adam. God's law called you guilty because each and every one of us have broken the law. But the good news is, is that through what Jesus did at the cross, yeah. blotted out, doesn't mean that, that God's law doesn't still stand as a compass and, and descriptive of the character of God and what's in his heart and that he desires for us to do his will. That's not what it means. It means that all of your failures, all of your transgressions have been blotted out through the shedding of the blood of Jesus. He no longer sees you as guilty. It was contrary to you. Why was it contrary to you? Because it was against you. He took it out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. All of your transgressions, all of your faults, all of your failures. Jesus took it upon himself and he nailed it to his cross. Then this is the part I want you to see. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. In it. What that means is that the triumph, the victory, came through Jesus right. and what he did for, the, yeah. for us at the cross. The Philistines had a troop. They were powerful. They were a multitude. They came against, but that one man withstood in the midst of that pea patch. And God used him, amen, to, to bring a victory on that day. But the victory was the Lord's victory. Yeah. It wasn't Shama. Right. What Shama did was he had the faith to believe God, that God was big, and more powerful than the enemy that he faced. And as he stood there, God wrought the victory. I got good news for you this morning for New Testament Christians. God has already wrought the victory in Christ. He's already produced it through what Jesus did at the cross. And because of your faith and continuance to stand in that, amen, God will give you the grace and the strength that you need amen. in order to continue to move forward in the things of God.